Hi, uh, this is uh, David Villar. Uh, I teach uh, pharmacology in a veterinary school. And I would like to tell you about something that has always been uh, puzzling to me. I never really had a very good grip on. And I bet many of you probably also uh, scratch your head or even flip a coin to decide whether uh, this animal requires an antibiotic uh, to have that uh, unsightly uh, diarrhea go away. Well, the good news is uh, that there are studies uh, breaking new ground on this topic. And as you will see uh, on the next video, and part of this one, there are new treatments that should probably be a, a vital uh, part of uh, new protocols uh, to treat uh, gastrointestinal problems. So with this uh, preliminary information uh, out of the way, uh, I think we can all agree that bacteria can cause diarrhea. There is no question on that. Uh, but what we should really be asking ourselves is whether the antimicrobials are going to take care of the problem? And the answer is no. And uh, we're going to uh, <coughs> see some examples of, of the worst uh, case scenarios in which you have an acute hemorrhagic diarrhea uh, caused by uh, Clostridium perfringens, or even a chronic diarrhea with overgrowth of uh, Clostridium difficile. And we'll see that using antimicrobials is not going to help getting uh, that animal out of the toilet faster. So here is uh, the first uh, poll questions for you guys. Uh, would you use antimicrobials in cases of severe diarrhea uh, with dehydration? Or how about uh, hemorrhagic diarrhea? Or even a diarrhea with uh, positive cultures or positive PCRs for uh, pathogenic bacteria? I'll give you a couple of seconds to think on this. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, I'm going to tell you that I've always been kind of uh, uh, trigger happy uh, jumping into uh, metronidazole for those uh, non specific diarrheas and I'm finally uh, I'm starting to uh, think out of the box so to speak uh, with uh, all the new evidence that is uh, coming out which uh, clearly points to not using antimicrobials uh, in most of these cases so the answer uh, to these questions is uh, no in every one of them and you may all be asking yourselves well uh, why not well there are several reasons uh, the first one is that uh, most uncomplicated cases of bacterial uh, diarrhea, even if we isolate the pathogenic bacteria or their uh, toxins, uh, that diarrhea will be uh, self-limiting and the administration of an antimicrobial could be more uh, harmful than beneficial. Uh, when we use antimicrobials, uh, uh, there is always the risk of uh, wiping out the normal uh, microflora of the intestines and basically uh, it, that could favor the proliferation of the bad guys that, that can cause diarrhea. Uh, and this is uh, really well documented in people and in some animal species. And the best uh, example that I can come up are uh, horses. Uh, horses are really prone to develop a fatal colitis uh, by uh, Clostridium difficile. And this is uh, particularly so if we use uh, drugs like uh, tetracycline so the macro, or, for example, the macrolide group of uh, antibiotics. And the second uh, big reason is that we can always uh, favor the appearance of resistant bacteria, uh, and that's really not, uh, making a lot of antimicrobials completely useless uh, these days. And I'm thinking of bacteria like uh, Salmonella or uh, Clostridium difficile if we talk about organisms that uh, cause diarrhea. So as you can see on this uh, consensus statement by the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, uh, the administration of antimicrobials is not advocated in uncomplicated cases. And basically what they suggest is just using supportive or symptomatic uh, therapy. So uh, even if your experience tells you that you had success using antimicrobials for diarrhea, uh, just remember that most patients will simply get better despite of what we do and uh, not because of what we're doing. So the next uh, poll question that I would like to uh, pose in which we definitely want to jump uh, into using some type of uh, systemic antimicrobial is uh, what do you think are uh, complicated cases? And uh, by far and away, uh, yes, the main complication is septicemia. You cannot allow uh, the bacteria to translocate from the GI and start multiplying throughout every uh, organ in that uh, animal. And uh, if we list some of the typical signs of uh, septicemia, severe lethargy, high body temperatures, uh, an inflammatory uh, leukogram, and this is uh, why doing some basic blood work becomes important because it can really uh, provide with very valuable information on the well-being of, of that animal and not only that but th on things that you may need to do uh, 
uh, to restore that uh, homeostasis. So uh, on the next uh, slides, we're going to s look at some studies that show evidence of why antimicrobials are not recommended uh, when we have an uncomplicated uh, hemorrhagic diarrhea. And I would like to start by asking you, how do you usually interpret uh, findings of uh, potential uh, enteric pathogens in a stool sample? And to answer this uh, question, uh, I'm going to show you this study, uh, which was uh, done in 169 puppies of less than a year of age. And this is an excellent uh, example uh, that the presence of uh, potential pathogens does not really uh, uh, tell you much uh, towards making a diagnosis. These were all uh, cases of acute diarrhea of less uh, than three days of duration. And they screen for all the potential pathogens that you can see on that list, uh, including five common bacterial ones. And their results uh, show that the prevalence is very similar in puppies uh, with or without diarrhea. Uh, so even when you detect the bacteria, it doesn't really tell you uh, whether you're really uh, hitting the jackpot. But having said this, uh, if you look for the toxins instead of the bacteria itself, uh, we can say the results become more sensitive. Uh, when looking uh, for the presence of uh, Clostridium perfringens in uh, stool samples, it's probably al almost always going to be there, uh, whether the dog is di has diarrhea or not. But if we look for the toxin itself with an ELISA test or for the gene that goes uh, for the toxin protein with a PCR technique, that will be uh, more informative. Uh, and if you combine uh, the two assays together, uh, you can be definitely more confident than th that there is an association between the diarrhea and the toxin. In any case, uh, just remember that uh, this is just an association which is different and it doesn't imply an, a, a cause and effect relationship. Uh, in other words, uh, there could be something else going on and uh, the finding of this uh, bacteria and its uh, toxin is something secondary. The primary cause uh, could be something that we're completely uh, missing and we will see this in a minute, at least for cases of uh, chronic diarrhea, uh, probably not so much for acute ones. So there is no doubt that uh, Clostridium perfringens can cause uh, uh, what used to be called acute hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. Now it's better called acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome because there is no damage to the stomach. And if we look at this paper from uh, 2018, they had dogs uh, with hemorrhagic diarrhea of less than uh, three days of duration, and they rule out uh, pretty much most of the other causes that can mimic uh, what Custodian perfringens uh, will do clinically. Uh, the one interesting thing on this paper is that all the animals uh, were positive for the gene of a toxin that was never looked before and now appears to be the one really destroying that uh, gut mucosa and creating those uh, necrotizing uh, lesions in the intestines. Uh, so from now on, uh, this uh, net uh, F toxin should probably be what, what we need to look for uh, to determine whether the Clostridium perfringens is the real thing uh, that is uh, actually uh, involved in in uh, producing that uh, diarrhea. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the triggering event or predisposing factor in this, uh, in this paper was never found. And I'll tell you that I've always uh, thought that uh, garbage eating or eating uh, any type of uh, spoiled food materials uh, by dogs uh, should always be suspected. And that's probably why you want to keep your dogs uh, from getting into the trash can. When we address the treatment of uh, bacterial diarrheas, uh, here is also a very interesting paper from 2018. They designed two different treatments uh, for dogs with acute hemorrhagic disease syndrome uh, caused by uh, Clostridium perfringens. And they had 25 dogs that met, that met the criteria uh, with signs of hemorrhagic diarrhea, some lethargy, dehydration, anorexia. Uh, there, were, there was no indication of septicemia, and they were all positive for the net uh, F toxin. So if I were to ask you, how would you treat these animals if they were to come in, in your clinic? They definitely need the symptomatic treatment, or they could develop a, a potentially lethal uh, hypovolemia. So basically, aggressive uh, therapy is going to be in, in place. Antiemetics, if there is vomiting, analgesics, if they have abdominal pain, and obviously uh, an easily digestible uh, gastrointestinal uh, diet. But how about antimicrobials? Well, as we just mentioned, uh, the answer is going to be no, unless there is a septicemia or there is no response to that uh, symptomatic uh, treatment.
The reason why they didn't use uh, antibiotics can be found in earlier studies like this one in which they used amoxicillin with uh, clavulanic acid for seven days. Uh, that, and they found that that didn't really uh, change the outcome or the time of recovery in dogs. So even though uh, the antimicrobials uh, were not causing any apparent uh, harm, uh, there is always the risk of wiping out the, the normal flora uh, in addition to promoting uh, resistance, uh, which is uh, already a major problem for many antimicrobials, as uh, I mentioned uh, before. So what, it, what is even mo more uh, worrisome is that in clinical practice, uh, most uh, veterinarians will reach for an antimicrobial combo uh, when they see hemorrhagic diarrhea in dogs. So again, uh, in this other study, uh, they found that uh, adding uh, metronidazole to the amoxicillin clavulanic acid uh, treatment did not really improve the course or the outcome of the disease. So we're not really gaining anything by giving uh, one antimicrobial in the first place uh, let alone uh, giving two together, uh, thinking that we're going to attain a synergistic uh, effect. And on this paper, they mentioned that uh, the chances of worsening uh, things should always be borne in mind uh, if we think that, that uh, we can uh, affect the normal microflora of that intestine. So if we go back to uh, the previous study, the latest story on the treatment of uh, dogs with acute hemorrhagic diarrhea is uh, truly uh, fascinating. If we look at this uh, title, uh, they use a probiotic uh, and look at the intestinal uh, microbiome. This is basically a quantitative uh, PCR that tells you the degree of uh, dysbiosis in fecal samples, uh, which is kind of a way to track changes in the gut uh, microflora uh, over time. Uh, healthy dogs uh, will have a positive uh, DI, and dogs that uh, with some type of uh, GI disease tend to have a negative index. So basically, the quicker we can tur turn this around, uh, the faster the animal is likely to make a recovery. And this is really where uh, probiotics uh, come into play. Uh, these are basically organisms that will uh, repopulate the normal flora. And by doing so, they, we could say they're going to outcompete and displace uh, the bad ones, uh, so to speak. And there are now uh, really numerous studies that are coming out of Europe and the U.S. Uh, that indicate a positive impact of some of the brand name uh, probiotics. Uh, they're good for reducing or improving the incidence of non-specific diarrheas or uh, those diarrheas that you don't really want to spend much uh, money and time uh, to diagnose uh, properly like uh, you might uh, encounter in a shelter uh, situation. Or, for example, those dogs that uh, have an idiopathic or chronic uh, inflammatory disease, uh, which are kind of uh, <clears throat> resilient to just about any treatments. And there, there are now even uh, reports that uh, even dogs with uh, parvo will benefit and improve faster uh, when these uh, probiotics are included in the treatment protocol. So if we see uh, what was done on this study, um, they initially had... 84 dogs with uh, acute hemorrhagic disease syndrome lasting less than uh, uh, of uh, less than three days of duration, and when they rule out everything apart from uh, Clostridium perfringens, uh, they were left with uh, 20, 25 dogs, and these were uh, divided into two groups: uh, one received the probiotic and the other one a uh, placebo for 20, 21 days. And they came up with a way of scoring the progression of the disease, uh, which is what they refer to as the canine hemorrhagic disease uh, severity index. And uh, they also uh, did uh, on day 0, 7, and 21, they collected uh, stool samples and they did the, the dysbiosis index and basically a complete workup for the Clostridium perfringens and its uh, toxins. And what they show is that if dogs uh, did not develop uh, uh, septicemia and they were provided with adequate uh, symptomatic treatment, they all would uh, make a complete recovery within a few days. But what is uh, most interesting is that the probiotic group had a faster uh, clinical recovery of three days as opposed to four days in the placebo group. And when they look at the microflora uh, of the gut, uh, there was a more uh, rapid return of the good bacteria uh, back to normal by day seven, uh, whereas the placebo was only normal by day uh, 21. And the two graphs uh, shows uh, two of the bacteria that they look at. 
but as you, the, you can see, there, there is already a very clear difference between uh, the two groups on day seven. And finally, uh, the probiotic uh, group also had a much rapid decrease of uh, Clostridium perfringens by day seven. And at this point, they were all uh, negative for the gene that produces the net uh, F uh, toxin, which is consistent uh, or uh, parallels uh, the faster uh, clinical recovery that you would expect to see uh, if there is no toxin being uh, produced. This is uh, the final uh, slide that I'm going to show on this uh, presentation. And I wanted to say something on uh, antimicrobials for cases of chronic diarrhea. In this case, they look at five dogs uh, with chronic diarrhea that were uh, not responding to uh, metronidazole. In all the animals, uh, they rule out most uh, causes of uh, chronic diarrhea, except for changes in the diet. And they found that uh, Clostridium difficile and its uh, two toxins uh, were uh, present in, in the stool of all the animals. And initially, you would be uh, prompted to believe that Clostridium difficile is truly the cause of diarrhea and that the bacteria has become resistant to metronidazole. Well, long, long and behold, uh, the presence of the Clostridium difficile uh, was not the primary cause of the diarrhea, and until the diet uh, was uh, changed, those animals did not get better. So the conclusion of this study was that the disruption of the microflora had, uh, had allowed for the proliferation of uh, the Clostridium, and this uh, was a secondary event to some uh, type of uh, constituent of the diet that was creating the inflammation and allowing uh, for the proliferation of those uh, negative bacteria to take place. As I said, this is the final slide. I would invite you to watch the other videos in which we address uh, in more uh, specific detail how to develop a problem-oriented approach to diagnose uh, causes of diarrhea and what are the latest uh, protocols uh, to treat different types of uh, diarrhea. Uh, that you may come across in daily practice. So uh, thanks again for watching, and I look forward to having you in, in future uh, presentations. Bye-bye. Uh,